All right. In this lecture, we'll cover acid-base reactions. This is, recall, the second type of uh, reaction in this chapter. So, uh, firstly, let's make sure we can define what acids and bases are. Uh, acids, by definition, are hydrogen ion donors. What this means is that they will, uh, they will give uh, hydrogen ions to another substance, usually to a base. And so, uh, in aqueous solutions, which means in water, uh, they'll form H plus ions. Now, uh, hy the hydrogen ion, if you take a look at it, is actually a proton. This is because hydrogen, from the periodic table, has only one proton and one electron, and if you strip its electron off, it'll acquire a positive charge, which uh, means all you have left is a proton. Protons being so tiny are very unstable. So in water, a proton really cannot exist by itself. Therefore, it teams up with a water molecule to produce H3O+. And here's then uh, an equation of what an acid does. So HCl hydrochloric acid will essentially produce an H+. And in this case, it does so by, you can think, dissociating or breaking apart into kind of like an ionic compound does. So you can have monoprotic acids like HCl. Monoprotic means you have one proton, is the idea. Diprotic, like sulfuric acid, and triprotic, like phosphoric acid. So, uh, that's we call these di and tri uh, protic just based on how many hydrogens they have here. Bases, then, are defined as hydrogen ion acceptors. And then, in aqueous solutions, and they will produce hydroxide ions, OHs. So bases essentially produce OHs. So you can kind of see, uh, see it here again with the dissociation reaction uh, where sodium hydroxide simply breaks apart into sodium and hydroxide ion in solution. Now here's another uh, base uh, reaction that I don't want you to worry too much about, but uh, ammonia, this is ammonia, is actually a base. It's a weak base, however, it's a base. And if you were to throw this into water and check for the presence uh, of hydroxide ions, you'd find that there's quite a bit of hydroxide present in water. This is because ammonia actually accepts an H plus from water. So actually, this H plus will go over to the ammonia, and since water can be thought of as HOH, what will be left over, essentially, is uh, just the OH portion, and that's what we've got here. So don't worry too much about understanding how ammonia uh, produces a hydroxide ion, but uh, realize that bases always produce hydroxide ions, by definition. So if you're strong, whether an acid or base, this means you completely ionize in solution. So again, any amount of uh, strong acid you put in solution, all of it breaks apart into hydrogen and uh, the other anion. And then weak acids or bases uh, partially ionize. Uh, this is a similar uh, uh, idea that we talked about with ionic compounds. Now, it's important to memorize the strong acids and bases, and I have them on the next sheet here, or on the next page. So first, the strong acids. Uh, let's think of them, there are seven of them, so let's think of them as being grouped these are binary, so uh, just go down the periodic table on the halogens group. You've got hydrochloric, hydrobromic, and hydroiodic. Then you've got some uh, polyatomic based acids or oxy acids. Uh, this is, if you remember, this is a chlorate, so eight becomes ic. You've got uh, chloric acid. This is perchlorate, so this is perchloric acid, uh, and uh, this is nitric acid and sulfuric acid. If you want to review how to name them, uh, you can go back to the summer homework. So these seven are strong acids. Any other acid that you encounter will consider it to be weak. For example, uh, if you were to have uh, carbonic acid, H2CO3, this would be a weak acid. And any other acid that's not on here technically would be a weak acid. Uh, likewise with bases, uh, any base, any hydroxide uh, that has a group 1 metal ion on it, by definition, uh, will be strong. And likewise, anything uh, from the second group that contains calcium, strontium, or barium will also be a strong base. 
And technically, if you take a look, it's uh, here it says that all soluble hydroxide compounds are strong bases. And that makes sense because if it's soluble in water, that means the hydroxide uh, will break apart from the metal cation and produce a bunch of OH-. And this is why this is the case. So uh, make sure you remember these seven strong acids and uh, these strong bases. Okay, so here's an example. Classify each of the following aqueous solutions as a non-electrolyte, weak electrolyte, or strong electrolyte. And what we mean essentially is if it completely uh, dissociates, then it'll be strong, uh, a strong electrolyte. If you throw it into water and all of it breaks apart, it'll be strong. If you throw it into water and it doesn't break apart at all, we'll call it a non-electrolyte. And if it dissociates partially, it'll be a weak electrolyte. So let's take a look at magnesium chloride here. And really the question is, uh, is magnesium chloride soluble? Well, if you take a look at the solubility rules, we'll see that chlorides are soluble, except that in the case of the three robbers, magnesium is not a robber. So magnesium chloride is soluble, and if it's soluble, then it'll break apart into magnesium 2 plus and chloride minus, all of it will. Therefore, magnesium chloride will conduct electricity and be a strong electrolyte. So uh, why don't we put for magnesium chloride as strong. All right, uh, moving on to, this is, uh, if you remember, BRO uh, is not bro, it's uh, hypobromite, so I becomes O, so this is a hypobromose acid. Hypobromose acid, if you'd like to uh, spell that, hypobromose acid. Now the question is, is hypobromous acid one of our strong acids? And the answer is, it is not. Uh, but nonetheless, it's an acid, so it'll release a little bit of its H plus into solution. But because it's not strong, it will not release all the H plus. So by definition, then, it will be a weak acid. Therefore, it will be a weak electrolyte. So hypobromous acid will be a weak electrolyte. Next, if you take a look at potassium hydroxide, uh, potassium hydroxide is a base because of the hydroxide. And since it is soluble, because all potassium ions or soluble compounds are soluble, potassium hydroxide will completely break apart in the water and uh, form all ions. So potassium hydroxide should also be a strong electrolyte. If you take a look at the next one, cobalt 2 sulfate. Now, Based on the solubility rules, sulfate is soluble, except uh, in the case of the three bandits. Now, cobalt is not one of the bandits, therefore, uh, cobalt to sulfate is soluble. And if it is soluble, again, if an ionic compound is soluble, by definition, it completely breaks apart in water. So it will be a strong electrolyte because all of it breaks apart. This will be a strong electrolyte. And lastly, oxygen. This one's a bit strange. It's not really a compound. It's just an element. But the point here is uh, if uh, oxygen could dissolve in water, in fact, uh, that's how uh, your fishies uh, breathe. They breathe underwater. They breathe oxygen. So because oxygen dissolves, we can classify it as a electrolyte or weak or strong or not. And in this case, because it does not break apart, it does not dissociate in any way, it'll be a non-electrolyte. So that's our only non-electrolyte is the idea. All right. Let's take a look then at uh, some reactions between acids and bases. And you'll recall that uh, an acid and a base reaction uh, forms salt and water. So this is kind of a, a general idea. But most of the time you've heard this in chemistry one. Uh, but what we'll do is here it says the cation for the salt. Now the salt, the word salt uh, actually means simply uh, an ionic compound. So a salt uh, just means ionic compound, uh, which is you know metal and non-metal. So uh, the cation portion of the salt essentially came from the base uh, because if you think about, uh, say, potassium hydroxide as the base, uh, so 
the potassium being the cation will for the salt will come from the base and then uh, the anion portion will come from the acid so if you think about uh, hydrochloric acid as the acid well your chloride the anion actually will come from the acid and effectively what you'll have is your salt will be um, chloride and potassium potassium chloride in this case so we'll, why don't we take a look at, at uh, the example right down here uh, this is the molecular equation uh, so we have hydrochloric acid and sodium hydroxide as our acid in our base and uh, what we see is that the salt this will be a, first of all this would be a double replacement reaction so think about sodium then replacing hydrogen since this is a double replacement reaction we can think of it as uh, simply swapping the cations and so sodium ends up with chlorine here form sodium chloride and then uh, what's left uh, in this instance because hydrogen comes in and replaces the sodium you get yourself HOH which in our case is actually water and then if you were to follow the rules and write the net ionic equation and we're actually going to do an example of it uh, first of all recall we have to write out the full ionic equation and then come down to the net ionic equation you'll actually see that it looks like this your sodium will cancel out as a spectator ion and so will your chloride and you'll end up with a hydrogen ion which comes from an acid reacting with hydroxide ion coming from a base forming your water okay and let's finish uh, this section with uh, an equation and we want the net ionic equation so we'll have to go through uh, first of all beginning with the molecular equation then to the full ionic and then we'll end up with the net ionic equation for this reaction all right let's try it let's first uh, write the full equation so we have iron 3 hydroxide reacting with nitric acid H NO3 so again we're going to think of this as a double replacement reaction so the iron will replace uh, the hydrogen and uh, let's as we've done before let's write in here uh, the uh, iron and uh, nitrate compound because iron in this case has a plus three charge and the reason you know it's a plus three charge is because it's teamed up with three hydroxides each hydroxide has a minus one charge therefore iron must have a plus three charge and nitrate we know has a minus one charge so from this we see that we need three nitrates for every iron and that's exactly what uh, we'll put in here so we'll put iron three nitrate And then the second substance will be water because when the hydrogen replaces the iron, you'll get yourself HOH effectively. So we'll write that as H2O. Now you may be thinking, but there are three hydroxides here. And for that, we will need to balance the equation. Balancing the equation will require us to put a three in front. Since we have three nitrates on the right, three in front of this to get three nitrates on the left. And then a three in front of here to get our... Uh, water to also balance so going on then let's get rid of this here uh, so we've got the molecular equation uh, and uh, what we're going for now is the full ionic equation first so the full ionic equation uh, recall that we first have to determine which substances are soluble because those that are soluble we will break apart into ions so in this case, iron hydroxide, if you recall, uh, hydroxides are not soluble. So in general, so this would be a solid. Nitric acid, being a strong acid, is very soluble. So we'll put it as aqueous. Iron 3 nitrate is also soluble because of the nitrate. So this will also be aqueous. And water, customarily, is a liquid. We, don't, we won't put aqueous for water because aqueous means some other substance is mixed and dissolved in water so if it's pure water it'll be a liquid so now anything that's aqueous will split apart so because iron 3 hydroxide is solid we'll keep it as it is so we just rewrite this as iron 3 hydroxide 
So the nitric acid will split apart into hydrogen, and when we split it up, it shows its ions, it shows its charges. So we got hydrogen ion and nitrate ion. Iron 3 nitrate is also aqueous. Let's split that up. Recall that iron has a plus 3 charge, and uh, nitrate has a minus 1 charge. And water, uh, being liquid, does not get split up. So we'll actually leave it as H2O. So we've got the full ionic equation. The next step, if you recall, is to cross out anything that appears the same on both sides. So in this case, if you take a look, the only thing that appears the same and does not change really is the nitrate. So our nitrates will actually be crossed out. Everything else changes going from the left to the right. The formulas change. So we'll keep the rest of it. And to finish with an ionic equation, we'll simply uh, pull down what we did not cross out, which is iron 3 hydroxide. Hydrogen ion from the acid, iron 3, and water. Lastly, before we go, let's go ahead and balance the equation. So uh, it looks like we have a total of, uh, looks like we have here on the left side, if you take a look, we got ourselves uh, three oxygens. So if we put a 3 in front of uh, our water, that'll balance the oxygens. That gives us six hydrogens here, uh, three of them here, and so we need three more in front of here. And that will give you a, a balanced equation. Now, uh, we also want to include usually the state symbols, uh, so just kind of taking a look at what exactly we had at the beginning. Uh, since iron hydroxide was a solid, we'll put a solid at the end of it. Since hydrogen ion came from nitric acid, which was aqueous, it'll be aqueous. Iron uh, came from iron 3 nitrate, and it was aqueous, so we'll put aqueous. And then water was a liquid. And this is what you want to put down uh, for, the, uh, for the answer. So there it is. We'll conclude here for this section. Thank you so much.